Section 2 uh, in this chapter introduces the Euler-Lagrange equation. So the Euler-Lagrange equation gives us a way for solving for y as a function of x such that we can minimize an integral of this form. So here what we have is uh, a functional f. Now f is called a functional because it is a function of functions. You can see in this case that it has a dependence on the function y. It can have a dependence on the function y prime, so the, the x derivative of y. And then it can also depend on our independent variable x. And so we have an integral of this form where we're integrating uh, with a functional. And again, we're interested in solving for y as a function of x that produces a, an extremum for this integral. So we want to figure out what's the right y to choose to produce either a maximum or a minimum for this integral. Okay, so to see how that works, let's imagine again we have our, our uh, line in the xy plane connecting two points, one and two. Here's our line. And let's imagine that we happen to know the right function y of x. Okay, So this is the right one. Um, and let's consider perturbing that function y of x so that we're choosing not quite the right path. Okay, And so we'll call this perturbed function capital Y of x. And we'll say that it's the right uh, function y of x plus a perturbation term, eta of x. Okay, And so what happens is that instead of choosing the right path, y of x, as shown here in black, we'll choose a path that's pretty close to y of x, but not quite. So maybe it looks like this. And so you can see that that's going to give us a path length which is bigger than the right value. Okay. Now we have some conditions on this function eta. It's not entirely arbitrary. We require that eta at x1 is equal to eta at x2 and that these are actually both equal to 0. So in other words, um, the, the perturbed path, capital Y of x, uh, starts at point 1 and ends at point 2 just like the right path Y of x, but in between it does other funny things. Okay, and now let's make our functional, uh, excuse me, our function eta, let's make it just a little bit uh, different so that we can actually do something useful with our integral. Let's imagine not just that it's just some arbitrary function that we're perturbing with its a function eta times some parameter alpha. Okay, so here alpha is just some number. It's just some scalar number. Um, and in order to make y and capital Y match up at the endpoints x1 and x2, we're going to say that alpha is equal to 0 uh, at point 1 and at point 2. Okay, so now we're going to write our integral for the total arc length using this perturbed function. And so this integral is going to be the integral from x1 to x2 over the functional, which in this case is going to be uh, something that represents the arc length. Okay, so here's our functional. It's a function of potentially of capital Y and capital Y's derivative with respect to x and x itself dx. And now, because we're going to integrate over x, you know, x is sort of a dummy variable, uh, s really depends only upon alpha. So alpha is essentially a free parameter in this equation, which we're, which we're going to uh, look at and take a derivative with respect to. And so what we'll find is some conditions on capital Y um, that depend on derivatives with respect to alpha. And what we'll get is an equation for the behavior of this functional that's required in order to make this integral an extremum. So let's look at what that looks like. So now rewriting our integral here, uh, we see that s is a function of alpha, shown here, and it's this function. Now we can make the replacement uh, for capital Y and Y prime uh, in this way. We know that we're adding uh, an alpha times an eta to Y, and then for the y prime term, uh, we're adding an alpha times an eta prime. Remember, alpha is just some scalar number, so we don't have a derivative of alpha with respect to x. And then so then we have this big functional here, 
when we're integrating over this whole functional. Now, in order for this integral to be an extremum with respect to alpha, meaning we've chosen the right alpha uh, in order to minimize or maximize this integral, we have to have it so that the alpha derivative of s is actually equal to zero. And you're familiar with this condition uh, when you're looking at derivatives of functions. You know that you're, if you have a function whose derivative with respect to the independent variable is equal to zero, you're either at a minimum or a maximum. And so the same thing is true here of our integral. And so what we're going to do next is to calculate what is the alpha derivative of all the stuff inside of this integral, uh, and that'll turn out to give us a condition for y, which will give us an extremum for the integral. Okay, so now we're going to take the alpha derivative of this integral up here. Uh, and of course, because the endpoints x1 and x2, they're independent of alpha, we can just take uh, this derivative with respect to alpha and put it inside the integral. So now we're just going to apply it to the functional f itself. And so now what we're interested in calculating is what is the alpha derivative of the functional f. Well, we can apply the chain rule to calculate that derivative. Uh, it's going to involve first the derivative of the functional with respect to capital Y. Remember, because this right here is capital Y times the derivative of capital Y with respect to alpha plus the derivative of the function with respect to Y prime times the derivative of capital Y prime with respect to alpha. Remember, this is capital Y prime here. Now, because of the way that we've defined our capital Y and capital Y prime, we can easily calculate the alpha derivatives. That's just going to be eta. And then for the alpha derivative of y prime, it's just going to be eta prime. And so let's incorporate all of that into our integral. So we can incorporate uh, our new information to calculate the alpha derivative of s. And we find that that converts this integrand into this expression here. So now we have one term involving eta and uh, the y derivative of f, and one term involving eta prime and the y prime derivative of f. Now we can do this integral. Uh, a couple of different ways. The, the, the way that the book chooses to do it is using integration by parts. And so what we find is we take this term right here. We can apply an integration by parts. Now remember, if you have the derivative of the product of two functions, and you're taking the integral of that, that's just going to be equal to, according to the product rule, the integral of the derivative of the first function times the second function plus the integral of the first function times the derivative of the second function. That's just applying uh, the product rule. Now we can solve for uh, the integral of, say, u and dv by rearranging this first equation. And what we get is uh, u and v evaluated between limits 1 and 2 here. Of course, the, deriv the integral of the derivative of, of a function is just uh, the, the, the function itself. And then minus the integral from 1 to 2 of du times v. And so all we're really doing here for integration by parts is trading the derivative of one function for the derivative of another, and then it just adds uh, a boundary term shown here. And so we can use this information to actually integrate this, as we'll see. OK, now so we can apply the integration by parts to integrate this guy. What we find is we get our boundary term here. So eta and df by dy prime evaluated from 1 to 2 minus the other term. And now the other term here it requires us to take another x derivative of df by dy prime. So now we're going to take an x derivative of that term. Well, this first term here, that's just going to be 0. Because remember, eta evaluated at x1 is equal to eta evaluated at x2. And that's just equal to 0. So that first that boundary term actually just turns out to be 0. And so we can rewrite uh, our integral term here uh, in this way. And so let's put this all together and see what our integrand turns into. And so coming back to our total integral and its alpha derivative, we've rewritten it in this way. So now what we have is uh, the first term involves eta being multiplied by the y derivative of f, and the second term now involves eta being multiplied by the x derivative of uh, df by dy prime. That means we can pull the eta up front, and so you can see eta comes up to here. And we have this integral of eta times this stuff here in the square brackets. Now, uh, eta is an arbitrary function. We've basically said nothing about eta so far. Um, it's an arbitrary function. And so in order for this integral to work out to be 0 
for any values of eta, whatever the function is, that means that everything in the square brackets has to be zero. Everything in square brackets has to be zero, and so that gives us a condition on our functional f, namely that the y derivative of f has to be equal to d by dx of the y prime derivative of f. Now that might seem like a little bit of an obscure expression, but it turns out to be hugely useful to solve uh, this integral problem that we came across earlier. And this uh, equation right here is referred to as the Euler-Lagrange equation. And as we'll see, it's a tremendously useful uh, equation that we can use both for Lagrangian mechanics and for these uh, calculus of variations kinds of problems that we've discussed already.